Where did October go? Hello, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader. So October was a really busy month for me. I read like 10 books in total, uh, including one which I think is a new favourite book of the year for me. The Booker Happened. Are we tired of talking about that yet? Well, it was so great hearing all the shortlisted authors give a reading at the South Bank Centre on the night before the big announcement. I even bucked up the courage to ask the first question uh, when it was Q&A time with the authors. George Saunders had been talking about how he changed changed the structure of his novel once he got into writing it because uh, at first he just had the ghosts talking to each other in this graveyard, uh, but then he wanted to incorporate bits from history so he went back and started rewriting some bits and inserting some bits. So I thought it would be interesting to ask the other authors if during the writing process of their books if uh, they had to go back at any point and change the structure of the novel to fit in with the story that they wanted to tell. And there was silence in response uh, and after um, uh, several seconds George Saunders just said like well I guess it was just me then. <laughs> so that went down well. Afterwards I did go get books signed by Fiona Mosley and Emily Fridland and I'm uh, grateful to say that there was no embarrassing moments uh, like in a previous video that I talked about of going to book signings. So that was a relief. Then on the night of the Booker Prize I was very kindly invited to a drinks reception at the Guildhall uh, where all the shortlisted authors gathered for a glitzy dinner um, before the big announcement happened. It was really quite surreal uh, walking into uh, this big glitzy party because uh, it was like, oh, there's Howard Jacobson and there's Mohsen Hamid uh, talking with the Duchess of Cornwall. And the person I was so thrilled to see uh, was not Paul Oster, but Paul Oster's wife, Suri Hustvet, was there, uh, who is, she is such a great author, and I was so like starstruck seeing her, and I, I kind of wanted to go up and say hello to her, but she was in a group of people talking, and so I just like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. I decided to make a big show of supporting Ali Smith on the night, uh, so I went out and had a t-shirt printed up, uh, which has a pink armadillo on it and is surrounded by autumnal leaves because Ali has told me previously that pink armadillos are her spirit animal. She was so overjoyed and happy when she saw it and we had a really nice long lovely chat. Uh, so I mean that made the whole night worth it. I mean I always feel really awkward at parties uh, like this, sort of like big formal affairs. Really I just want to spend all my time in like t-shirts and jeans and lounging around. Plus I sort of feel like out of place because I'm not really in the publishing industry, like everybody there were like publishers and journalists, uh, but I'm just a book reader. It was funny, at one point I was chatting with this journalist uh, who hadn't read any of the books, but he said he had to write an article about the Booker Prize, so he was um, trying to find out from me if there was any like gossip about any of the authors, uh, which is so like weird. I mean, it's like a book prize where we're like talking about literature and he wants to find some like big scandal. But wouldn't it have been funny if I had like planted a story and said something like, uh, you know, Paul Oster is having an affair with Fiona Mosley, but you didn't hear it from me. Wouldn't that have been hilarious. Anyway, I went to some of the publishers parties afterwards. Um, it's kind of weird, like each uh, publisher has their own individual party for their author and uh, lots of people jump around between these different parties. So I mostly stayed at the Penguin party to continue cheering Ali on. It was a shame she didn't win, but of course I loved Lincoln in the Bardo. I've already gushed so much about it in previous videos. It's a brilliant novel and when the Booker long list was announced I actually placed a bet on Lincoln in the Bardo winning. So I ended up winning 55 pounds out of my 10 pound bet, uh, so that was pretty good. Other than the Booker Prize, the London Film Festival happened in October and I saw I think like 11 or 12 films in total, uh, it's quite a lot. And I saw all these just over the course of a week. But it was really exciting because a lot of these films won't be on general release for another few months at least. This is a book wrap up, not a film wrap up, so I'm only going to mention really briefly uh, films that I thought were really excellent. There was Lean on Pete, uh, which is a story about an adolescent boy who uh, finds this emotional connection with this horse after he's left with no support network. And that sounds really corny, uh, but it's really emotional and so well done. It was directed by Andrew Haig, um, who um, 
made the extraordinary film Weekend. There was Ex Libris, uh, Frederick Wiseman's new documentary about the New York City Public Library, uh, which was so fascinating. There was Lady Bird, uh, which I think is out in the States uh, now, currently, uh, and that's um, Greta Gerwig's uh, directorial debut. It was totally wonderful and lovely. There was Faces Places, a documentary by Agnes Varda about her traveling around the French countryside with a young artist and the collaborations that they do to try to like bring these communities together. It was such a beautiful and heartwarming film. And my favorite film of the whole week was called 120 Beats Per Minute. This is a French uh, fictional film uh, about the ACT UP movement during the 90s. It's all about AIDS and activism and relationships. I really hope that it wins the Oscar Prize for Best Foreign Language Film uh, next year at the Oscars. Uh, so definitely go see that. It's an amazing film. Now on to what I read. There's Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan. Uh, I almost said On Chisel Beach, but that's an Ian McEwan novel, isn't it? I've not read Egan's writing before, and from what I understand, this is much more of a kind of traditional type novel uh, than what her other writing is, uh, which is a bit more experimental. It's basically a straightforward historical novel about a young woman and a gangster boss during World War II. And now, normally if I heard, like, gangster boss, I'd be totally put off because I just don't care about gangster stories. It just feels like so much macho crap. But this, I really liked. Egan shows this gangster boss named Dexter in a really dynamic way and how he's sort of caught between uh, these opposing powers of sort of extreme criminality and uh, like corrupt politicians. It's also the story of a young woman named Anna who works in the shipyards uh, because a lot of the women um, did a lot of the factory work uh, because the men were all at war. And she has a burning desire to become a diver who works on ships underwater. The way Egan describes her experiences underwater is so beautifully moving. Then the story brings these two characters together in a fascinating way, uh, so I really enjoyed this novel. Then I finally read Exit West uh, by Mohsen Hamid, shortlisted for the Booker. After hearing lots of criticism about this novel, I was really worried going into it, but I ended up quite admiring it, uh, more for its like structure and concepts than its plot. It follows this couple, Nadia and Saeed, who live in an unnamed city, uh, which they eventually have to flee because it's sort of been torn apart by civil war. But they can escape because inexplicably these portals into other countries um, have been opening up through doors. And it turns people from different countries literally into each other's neighbors. So it makes a big interesting statement about immigration, which is obviously such a hot political topic, uh, but also it exudes like a really positive point of view about the way people can make new futures for themselves and restructure society. And there are also like fascinating things about the characters like Nadia's determination to wear traditional uh, black robes even though she's not religious herself and the way Saeed uh, maintains his faith in a different form. But overall it felt more like a concept novel than one with like a really heartfelt story but nevertheless I really liked this book. I also read the Parcel by Anosh Arani, and oh my gosh, this book, I loved this novel so much. I was totally blown away by it. It follows the life of Madhu, who is an intersex individual, and in India, uh, these people are called hijras. Hijras form their own communities within society, and uh, they, they form these houses with a hijra mother. It's basically a form of queer family. And the story shows what life is really like for hijras in Indian society, uh, this like strange position they hold, because uh, at once they're like quite revered traditionally um, in the religious practices because um, they're seen as having sort of supernatural powers but then at the same time they're totally outcast often having to resort to prostitution or begging for money. So the novel presents this incredibly sympathetic character of Madhu uh, who is 40 years old and who has had such a difficult life 
Uh, but then it presents this dilemma with her involvement of inducting children who have been sold into prostitution into brothels. So this is a really dark, heartbreaking story, but it's also incredibly powerful and effective. It asks so many meaningful questions about identity, social responsibility, and the plight of people who have been rendered voiceless. I think it is absolutely one of the most extraordinary novels I have read all year. I'll put a link to my full review of it uh, below uh, if you want to read more of my thoughts about it because I feel like I can't quite express um, everything that I feel about this novel. A very different kind of novel I read was Andrew Michael Hurley's new novel called Devil's Day. Uh, this is a like, cool special edition that I was sent uh, before the publication. So just like Hurley's very successful debut novel, The Loney, uh, this novel portrays isolated rural traditions and superstitions and village secrets in a very creepy and atmospheric way. The story's about a man named John who grew up in a very rural uh, farming, sheep farming community in Lancashire, but has since moved away and married a woman named Catherine, who is now pregnant. This couple returned to his childhood home uh, because his grandfather died, and also to help his family in the community um, celebrate in this local tradition known as Devil's Day, where the local people uh, have this ceremony to invite the devil into their homes to, in, to try to spare uh, their flocks of sheep um, from the devil ravaging their flocks of sheep, and then they have to expunge the devils from their home. It's a twist suspenseful tale, uh, really vividly written, and I hugely enjoyed it. And I also listened to the audiobook of 4321, uh, shortlisted for the booker, uh, by Mr. Paul Oster, and narrated by the author himself. What a big mess of a book! <laughs> Uh, okay. I actually liked most of the story. The whole complicated family drama of betrayal and stolen money and gambling and secrets. And I'm compelled by the larger point he was making by how he structured the novel in that we follow this one young man throughout um, different versions of his life and his adolescence and growing up. So one small decision means that your life goes off in a different way and changes other things about that life. That's all fun, and it's the same like prominent theme that um, features in like most of Paul Oster's writing and his novels. But then there's all the baseball. There's so much baseball in this book, and and I'm actually somebody who really likes baseball. Like I, I like going to baseball games, uh, but he geeks out about baseball so much. And then you also have to watch the same boy going through puberty and having sex for the first time, like, multiple times, which gets sort of tiring. And the different paths in his life that he takes seems to, like, follow very neatly with particular themes that Oster wants to explore, uh, like racism or war or politics or an author's education in how to write. There's also the issue in one storyline how Archie, uh, who's the protagonist, um, becomes initiated into sex by a predatory uh, young man. Archie is gradually seduced into having sex with this young man and then continues having sex with him in that heteroflexible way where some young men uh, will have sex with anybody really um, just because they're horny and other options aren't available. Now I can see how this is perceived as homophobic, like not in the, the content of the story but in the structure that Paul Oster gives to it in that in this storyline the sex is presented in quite a deviant way, where the sex would legally be classified as pedophilia uh, because of the age difference in the boys. And in other storylines he only engages in normal heterosexual loving sex. Although it's not always loving, there's like one storyline where he becomes quite addicted to seeing a prostitute and the lengths that he goes to to try to procure money um, to continue seeing this prostitute. You can watch Matthew Sharapa's series of vlogs where he's talking about this novel and how he perceives it as uh, very homophobic, and he really eloquently explains why he finds it so offensive. I'll link that below. The relationship that Archie has with this young man uh, definitely isn't good and is a form of abuse. I mean, this is a very hot topic at the moment with the whole, like, Kevin Spacey mess. But personally, I don't feel that it's Oster being homophobic. It's actually a very logical way to write about the position of an adolescent boy like this, and Oster makes it very clear 
clear in the narrative that he doesn't think that homosexual sex is deviant. However, this is a very heterocentric novel. This is all about multiple versions of a straight young man's life written by an older straight man. You're always aware of seeing it through that perspective. So I'm going to leave it there, uh, but overall I felt that this novel didn't really justify its length. But there were a lot of compelling things about it. I don't know. Uh, go watch Matthew's vlog and like see where you fall in this whole argument of whether it's homophobic or not homophobic. Um, although really, I think I'm right. I also participated in the Autumn Readathon in the last week of October. I made a two-part vlog talking about all my thoughts about the five books that I read during this week, so I won't go into them much here. I'll put the links to those below, but if you want my very, very brief reviews, yeah, yes, 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 oh yes, yeah. So that's what I've been reading and doing. Uh, gosh, it felt like it took like most of November just to recap what I've been doing in October. But how are you doing? Uh, have you read any of these books that I've talked about? And if so, what did you think about them? Ooh, my voice squeaked there a minute. What did you think about them? <laughs> or just let me know what else you've been reading lately. Uh, so I hope you have a fabulous day, uh, weekend, month, year, rest of the year, and I'll speak to you again soon. Happy reading, everyone!